Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to show you the big game between the two tournament leaders of the FIDE candidates. So far, after nine rounds, there are two players on five and a half points and they are meeting each other in round 10. It is Janne Pomnichi against Gukesh and in their first encounter the game ended in a draw but Gukesh had pretty good chances to win that game. It's something I covered earlier uh, on the uh, channel and uh, probably you have seen it. If not, it's worth checking it out. It was a nice technical uh, game and if you haven't seen it yet, well, make sure to do so and subscribe to the channel if you would like to see more games from this uh, fantastic event so far. Now, this is a game you don't want to miss because the winner of this game has a very good chance to win the event outright. I mean, there are still a couple of games uh, more to go, but who knows, we will see what is uh, going to happen. Jan de Pomnici opens the game with one e4 and after e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop e5, the Rue Lopez, Spanish opening, black goes for the move a6, bishop to a4, and now maybe a very small surprise here by Gukesh, as he played here the move knight g e7. This is not a novelty, it has been played many times before, but developing the knight in this way rather than developing, developing it uh, to f6, it is uh, somewhat more uh, passive. But it leads to interesting play and it has also been played by some other uh, young ambitious uh, players. And I think it is pretty much in uh, Gukesh's style. He is not the most theoretical guy. He likes to drop some surprises, get a game and he really relies on his general understanding, his calculation, rather than trying to uh, get an edge out of the opening uh, with either color. So, well, here there are different ways of playing. And I would say that the main two continuations are just castling kingside and or playing the move c3. That is uh, pretty much the standard idea to prepare the advance in the center, always being able to recapture with your c-pawn. But Jan de Pomichy played here the move d4, opening up the center right away. And it's considered not to be the uh, most challenging continuation. Still, it may lead to very interesting play. Pawn takes d4, knight takes d4. And now the knights are getting swapped as well. So the queen comes into the game. And you know that normally you shouldn't bring your queen out too early. But here, being placed in the center, it does control a lot of squares. So white seems to be somewhat more active. But black's idea here is to follow up with the move knight c6, attacking the queen so that uh, later on you're able to get your dark squared bishop out as well. White played its queen to e3. This may look strange because normally you don't want to stand in the way of your dark squared bishop, but probably that is just temporarily. It's, um, it's clear that the queen will move very soon as uh, well. And uh, well, there are different ways of uh, playing here for black. Bishop e7 looks like it is a, a pretty uh, solid continuation. White developed its knight to, uh, to c3. Black uh, castled here. And well, I, I think that if white would castle now, let's say uh, you play that move, which was not played in the game, I guess the idea is to put a rook on e8 very soon and to try to put some pressure against the pawn on uh, e4 with the rook. But let's go back, because instead of castling, here white played a move knight to d5. That is kind of an ambitious move because white wants to trade off the knight for the bishop and say that it's an open position and these two bishops, they are potentially better than the knight and the bishop. So white can get something to, uh, to play for in the long run. But it's concrete position and here black goes for the move b5, attacking the bishop on a4. The bishop goes back to b3 and now there is this move knight to a5. So you see that if white is ever gonna take, you can just take back. And very soon this knight on a5 will trade itself for the bishop on b3 and not much uh, remains on the board. I mean, it's still a playable position, but black looks, it is rock solid in uh, this position. So here, white played the move queen to g3. So what is this queen doing? Well, there are ideas, first of all, to get the bishop out to h6 and put pressure against the pawn on uh, g7 because the pawn will be, pins, will be pinned. And secondly, the queen on g3 also hits the pawn on c7. So what should black do? Well, there are various ways of playing. In a way, the move played by Gukesh, it is quite interesting. It's a tempo move. You're moving the bishop away 
from e7. So the knight can no longer trade it itself for the for the bishop. The bishop defends the pawn, and of course it hits the queen on um, on g3. Now you wish you could just gain another tempo by playing the move e5, but here we see the problem of White's play that he hasn't castled yet. There is this move: bishop takes e5, queen takes e5, rook e8. And the queen will be lost. So therefore, after bishop d6, white cannot kick the queen, uh, uh, kick the bishop away with the move uh, e4, e5. Played here, bishop f4 instead. But these sort of simplifications they make black's life much easier. Bishop takes f4, queen takes f4. Now once again, the pawn on c7 is under threat, but the pawn goes to d6. So the, the threat is uh, solved and after castling, black can also just get its bishop uh, into the game via e6. So there is this idea that at some point you're going to take on b3 and then you're going to take on d5 as well. And then it will be a battle with only major pieces left on the board. So here, rook fd1, it's always a discussion whether which rook you, you should take. But here, by playing rook fd1, White is saying that, okay, if black is going to take on uh, b3, you do take back with the a pawn. And then the rook from a1, it may uh, exert a bit of pressure against that pawn on uh, a6. But black is not in a rush here. Just played a number of uh, useful moves here uh, first before releasing the tension. Went here for the move rook e8. That's where the rook belongs on the half open file, eyeing the uh, pawn on uh, e4. White makes a uh, useful waiting move, a3. Certainly not the only move, but... Black does the same, just h6. Maybe at some point, even ideas with queen g5, offering the exchange of queens, may become an uh, option, though, as long as the knight is on c7, this queen cannot leave the protection of the pawn on c7. But now, things are getting interesting. As white played here the move rook d3. Now, finally, a bit of action here, with the rook coming over to the king side very soon. And then white is looking for tactical opportunities against that king. So how should uh, black uh, respond? Well, I was looking at this position and I was thinking, well, when white is about to launch an attack, let's get rid of a number of pieces. Why not to take on b3? It was not played in the game, but it seems to me that in a position like this, after taking back with a pawn and then take with the bishop the knight, there, there's this exact type of uh, play I've mentioned earlier, only major pieces on the board, but here black, just looks very solid and uh, well you can uh, target the pawn on e4 i don't think there are any attacking chances on the king side so that would be a very solid way of playing but instead gukesh played here this move c5 that is a very sharp move as he's ignoring the the potential threats on the king side and basically he says that i'm ready to go c4 and trap your bishop hit the rook on d3 so this is a, a very Difficult uh, moment, this difficult decision to make here for, for white. And probably it's the only inaccurate move here in the game. Because what white played now is the move rook to g3. This is the move I had expected as well. It was played pretty fast by Napo, but in hindsight, it is better to, uh, to play here something like c3 so that your rook stays on the d file, maintains control over that uh, d5 square. And in a way, a move like c5, it's, it's, it's really weakening because you give yourself a backward pawn on the d file. And if white does have a bit of time, that pawn on d6 may prove to be a serious weakness. What is the basic idea here that you can simply allow c4? Here are just a bit of analysis to, to show you what could have happened after this. Because now rook g3 is just a great move. If you do take the bishop, there is queen takes h6. The queen cannot be taken. If you do play g6, the knight comes to f4. And very soon you're going to take on g6. Followed by taking with the rook. This king's position will be blown um, up. And uh, well, it's, it's, it's pretty bad here for, uh, for, for black already. And there are also other ideas that instead of taking the bishop... You may eliminate that knight first, uh, but then the uh, the best way of playing here probably is to um, to play something like bishop c2. This may look strange, but your bishop is saved and you're ready to take on d5 and then you have a beautiful diagonal for your queen and bishop, while the attempt to, to save the extra piece will be met by queen takes h6, threatening mate again. 
If you do play g6, then you play e5 and look at this, bishop takes g6, is about to be played. If you've got to take back, the rook takes and it's going to be checkmate in a few. Black has to find a few only moves. If this would have happened all in the game, I'm pretty sure Gukes would have found it. But nevertheless, he got to protect that pawn on uh, g6. Then it's bishop to f5 to try to eliminate this uh, rook. But here black is in time to initiate the exchange of queens. Queens can get swapped. You can take on e6, take on g6. And well, it's complicated position. Two minor pieces against the rook. But white has a bunch of extra pawns on the king side. So I tend to believe this is uh, just favoring the side with the extra rook. So white is having very good uh, practical chances. But well, this was not played in the game. And uh, Napo, as I said... Played here the move uh, rook g3. Once again, don't take on b3 because of queen takes h6. That is not something you want to allow. Gukesh played it absolutely safe. Just sidestep with his king to, uh, to h8. It's safe in the corner. Queen takes h6 no longer possible. You can just take the pawn. And if you now after c3 uh, simply eliminate the bishop on uh, b3, pawn takes back, bishop takes d5, e takes d5, well the... Pawn on uh, f7 is under threat. Black played here, queen d7. It looks like black is rock solid. There are no threats against the black king. Black is controlling the only open file. But white is uh, probably okay here still. I mean, you can um, just put a bit of pressure on the queen side. That is what white did here with the move uh, b4. Trying to eliminate that pawn uh, on uh, c5. After c takes b4, the queen recaptured. The rook came to e5 to uh, to hit the pawn on d5, but here the queen comes to d4. Not only to defend the pawn on uh, d5, but also setting up a little trap here. Because the move you would like to play as black is the activation move, like rook a e8. But that runs into the move f4, attacking the pinned piece. Because if the rook goes away, let's say you give a check on e1, the rooks are getting swapped. There is king f2, you are uh, attacking the uh, rook on e1 but you're also threatening checkmate on g7 so that means that white is going to win the rook of course gukesh is not going to fall for that uh, very simple idea and what he played instead is a nice technical uh, move here the move queen a7 offering the exchange of queens white played here the move rook d3 so uh, if if you're gonna take you take back with the rook and everything is well covered Black played here first, the move rook e2, hitting the pawn on b2. Now rooks are getting swapped. White played the move b4, so saving the pawn. But we have here this double rook endgame in which neither side is really able to make uh, progress as it seems. In the next couple of moves, there are very natural. Rook c2, taking the pawn on c3, a rook to e1. The king already goes to h7, so rook e8 doesn't come with check. And now the rook is on its way probably to d8 and try to win the pawn on d6. So this is the moment that the rook from a7 should come into action. Rook to c7. Now after rook a8, you're attacking the pawn. Rook takes c3. Rook takes c3. Rook takes. Rook takes a6. Winning the pawn on d6. But black will win the pawn on b4. So here, play is petering out now. Rook takes on d6, rook captures the pawn on b4, rook b6, rook b1 check, king h2, a few more moves only, b4, d6, rook gets behind the passed pawn as well, white eliminates the pawn and so does black, now it's a free versus free, and here on move 40 the players agree to a draw, so here we don't have, as the Germans say, uh, a four Entscheidung, there's not a decision yet, the players are still maintaining their pole position in the tournament after 10 rounds they are on six out of uh, 10 plus two it's a modest uh, score but still very good Jan de Pondici is still unbeaten didn't lose a single game in this event we remember that he had a few uh, games in which he was struggling with the black pieces but still unbeaten is very impressive uh, performance and with four more rounds to go Anything can still happen. Make sure to come back to the channel in the next couple of days. I will keep you uh, posted about the most exciting moments from this Feed the Candidates event. And 
just please hit the subscribe button. Thanks for doing that. I will see you soon again. Bye-bye.